Hello and welcome. We're going to start talking about legal descriptions and plotting them. I just got to remind you that we all come to this gathering with different education, different backgrounds, and we all use different dictionaries to talk to each other. And it's very hard to talk to land surveyors because we, we're very technical in terms. We use different nomenclatures and things like that. So we want you to ask questions. We want you to participate. This is for your benefit, not ours. So if you don't understand anything, just ask us, okay? So I'm Christopher McDonald, part of the board here, and I'm going to introduce you. I'm gonna let Tasha introduce herself. She knows more about her than I do. She's been doing this a very long time, and she's been educated on how to present to the masses, so she'll do a whole lot better job than me. <laughs> Tasha. Thank you, Chris. Welcome, everybody. My name is Tasha Hutta. I've got, uh, I've, I'll, I'm an honest, straight shooter kind of person. Um, they give me a mic today. I tend not to use a mic very often in my hand. I talk a lot with my hands. If I start getting wild, somebody just give me a little signal. Um, if I need to be louder, softer, give me a little signal. Uh, I've got my notes on my iPad here, trying to be a little technology savvy, um, and totally didn't even think that I would have to have a mic in my hand. So <laughs> bear with me today. Um, my name is Tasha Hutta. I am a BLM cadastral surveyor. I've been with the BLM for 24 years now. Um, and I, I kind of say I was born into the Bureau. I come with a very distinct federal perspective. Um, so if I say things today that might sound a little bit off or it might be confusing to you, just understand that I come from a you know, pretty distinct federal perspective and um, I, can, I can get out of that, but it, it's definitely my comfort zone. Um, so I, I tend to speak from there a little bit more, um, just information. This is my first time attending the Tribal Lands Conference. I'm very excited to be here today um, and welcome to each of you. Uh, let's see, uh, where, do, where do I live? Um, so I am a National Training Center employee. I train cadastral surveyors within the Bureau of Land Management, within all of federal government, actually. Um, but I'm physically located in Anchorage, Alaska. I've been up there for about 22 years now, um, and before that in Colorado. Um, so very much a Western States kind of gal. I need mountains in my life. Ah, so I am a surveyor. I deal with land descriptions all the time, but I'm curious um, about you guys. This is a topic of interest for you. Who in here uh, deals with land descriptions kind of on a daily basis? A lot of hands. How about on the other end of the spectrum? Maybe just once or twice a month you have to deal with it. Okay, we got quite a spectrum of experience in here. So uh, there's some topics that I might linger on. Um, if I'm taking too slow, just tell me to speed up a little bit. Um, or if I'm going too fast and I'm glossing over some terminology that is kind of confusing, just have me slow down a little bit. Um, or come visit after. Uh, Chris and I will be in the BLM booth uh, for the entire conference. So if there's any questions um, that you have, feel free to come and ask us after as well. Uh, as we get started here today, I wanted to first make sure that everyone knows I don't want to just come here and talk to you for an hour, hour and a half, um, and then leave you with no resources. So one of the resources I wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of, the Bureau of Land Management has a site called our KRC, our Knowledge Resource Center. Uh, what I put up here is some training that's available on our Public Resource Center, um, and I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to go to the homepage, actually, of our... KRC site. Uh, our Knowledge Resource Center is a public facing site. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of training content on here as you see when I pull down this menu on the left side. Um, but what you guys are gonna be interested in is lands and realty, which again gets you a whole bunch more pull downs right here. Um, but specifically cadastral survey in general, and that is where you're gonna find this interpreting and writing land description site. This is a self-study course. It is, I think it was eight or so modules. Talks about a lot of the things that um, I'll be discussing with you today, but it also has some additional modules on land status records, which I don't talk about at all. Really great resource of information. 
Um, and then you can see some other resources here as well as uh, basic map reading. So if you have anyone new in your office um, and you'd like to get, make sure to get them familiar with land descriptions, this is a really good self-study training that's available. Um, or if you're one of those people that just don't deal with land descriptions on a regular basis and would like a refresher, uh, again, a really good resource. Uh, some other resources that I wanted to make sure, um, I had hoped to have these printed out and available at our table, but I just uh, ran out of time. Um, many of you can probably understand how that goes. Um, but the first of all is uh, just making sure that you guys have access to, a lot of these are on our GLO website as well, uh, General Land Office Records. Uh, and I just wanna put this up graphic here. So this is a map of all of the principal meridians within the United States. All of our, uh, the public land survey system is a beautiful system. Um, and I'll, I'll get more slides on it later. But the foundation of this is our principal meridians. So you see every single principal meridian is colored individually on, a, on the map here. And you can see that some principal meridians go into multiple states. So whenever we're writing our land descriptions, we always say our principal meridian spelled out fully. And we also call the state. Um, because it can uh, be in multiple states. So what other resources do you guys have available to you? Uh, this one right here, specifications for descriptions of land. Uh, this is available electronically on our uh, CFEDS website, uh, as well as our GLO Records website. And we also brought some hard copies that are at our booth out there. This is the handbook for legal descriptions, and I highly encourage you guys to have this in your toolbox, either as the hard copy that you have on your desk or as an electronic copy that you can go and reference. Um, some other little handy-dandy kind of job uh, legal land description uh, help sheets here, uh, and also our certified uh, federal surveyor list. Um, and I'll just put up this first one here. But so the CFEDS program, if you guys are, how many of you in here are familiar with the CFEDS program, have interacted with CFEDS? Excellent. So there were less hands um, not raised. So our, the Certified Federal Surveyor Program is a training program that was developed, oh, probably about 15 years ago now. It's a specialized training program for land surveyors that give them training on the surveying of lands in Indian country. So they have to take uh, some pretty rigorous training as well as some exams and some testing, uh, and they have a, a, a really good resource. So uh, on our certified federal survey, surveyors list, we can see that there are 523 of them across the nation uh, in various states on the CFEDS website. You can access all of their contact information, uh, and there are additional resources available to everybody. Uh, as well as our BLM Indian Land Surveyors, our bills is what we call them. So here in California, uh, Alan Kimbrough is your bills surveyor. Uh, and so our bills are Bureau of Land Management surveyors who reside in BIA regional offices and help with all of the uh, transactions there that involve legal descriptions, uh, anything needing surveys, et cetera. So what are we gonna do today uh, in our shortened time here? Uh, go through a lot of material <laughs> in a pretty quick amount of time, actually. Uh, terminology, the required elements of a land description, talking about proper order. Uh, when you're writing land descriptions, there is a certain order that needs to be followed. We'll go through all of that, make sure that everyone's comfortable with it. Uh, talk about some common mistakes that you're gonna encounter with land descriptions. Speak a little bit about acreage. I'll do a demonstration of writing a land description so we can all have some practice going through that together. Uh, oh, the exercise, I should have taken that out. I teach this class uh, pretty regularly as a four hour time block uh, where we go through exercises uh, and things like that. So if, I, if you feel rushed, it's because I feel rushed. I'm 
<laughs> trying to slow myself down a little bit. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end and I can do a demonstration of plotting a legal description onto a master title plot, a title plot. This is something that um, is really helpful in kind of verifying your description, seeing it visually, there's a whole bunch of advantages uh, to doing that. So what is the definition of a legal description? Get my notes going again. So I really love this definition from the, uh, let's see, who is this one from? The American Congress on Surveying and Mapping. And I, I hate to read slides, but I'm gonna read this one uh, just because this definition is important. So a description recognized by law, which definitively locates property by reference to government surveys, coordinate systems, or recorded maps, a description which is sufficient to locate the property without oral testimony. There's a lot of information in that little definition there. So many of you work with legal descriptions, land descriptions on a regular basis. Some of them are a lot better than others, right? Yeah, definitely. So how do we know what is a good one? How do we know um, which ones are adequate to achieve the purposes that we're trying to do with those? And this is a really good baseline for having to, to determining if those descriptions are adequate, that it is sufficient to locate the property without oral testimony. So the land description, along with the maps that it's associated with. The legal principle there is are considered one and the same. When you have a land description that calls for a map or calls for a deed, they're considered the single same document. So a description that calls for a, a map or a record and can be located without oral testimony, meaning that uh, if I am a surveyor assigned to that project and I need to go and mark those boundaries on the ground so that we can manage that property, that I don't need to talk to the neighbors. I don't need to um, you know, see, uh, just find out additional information, that that land description itself with those maps is sufficient enough without any ambiguity, without any uh, arguments at all, that, that description is adequate. Uh, let's see, so why is it important to have an accurate land description? I, I threw just a few up here on the slide, um, but the base message when it comes to accurate land descriptions is that we cannot properly manage, develop, or protect lands from trespass or encroachment unless we know with certainty the location of those boundaries. Is that fair? I'll let you guys read what's up here What's an, for an accurate land description. Is there anything I'm missing? Why is it important to you guys? to have an accurate land description. Is anyone run into any trouble because their land description was a little insufficient? Trespass issues? Yeah, what were you gonna say back here, sir? Oh, raising your hand, no problem. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management uh, when our reservation was first created back in the 1800s, it was supposed to be about 1.8 million acres. Well, the federal government came in, I don't know if there was a BLM back in those days, but the federal government came in and never really did a, never did really do an accurate survey. And as a result, we lost over 660,000 acres. That's a lot. So uh, we started asking the uh, Bureau of Land Management to come out and do a resurvey so that we can uh, try and get uh, as, much, as much land of that back. Well, they came out and they must have been just as bad as the ones in the 1800s because they never did really finish. They never did do an accurate land description. They never did, never did do it right again. And then they, when we questioned them about that and they said they ran out of money and we said, no, no, no. Yeah, you're wrong. <laughs> the Bureau of Land Management really hasn't been a good friend of us. They do a lot of land swapping without our knowledge sometimes. And sometimes they do it for industry. And the industry in our area is a super fun site. Well, they're running out of place to store all their contaminated waste. 
So here comes the Bureau of Land Management saying, well, hey, we can do a land swap with you. And to, much to our objection, it, was, it happened. Uh, the Bureau of Land Management has failed our tribe in doing what is right in reclamating the land from mining activity on the reservation. They never did do a complete reclamation. And the Bureau of Land Management has been there helping them stall, helping the industry, not doing what they should be doing. So we said, well, who has, the, who has that authority? You know, the tribes, uh, you know, we might have uh, allowed the developers to come in and mine, but it was always with the idea that they were gonna reclamate. Well, the Bureau of Land Management hasn't been allowing them to fully reclamate and, and allowing them to walk away. And yeah, now we have all these big gouges on the, within the reservation in our hunting areas. So the Bureau of Land Management, when you talk about all of these good things that they, you think they do, the realities of things is, uh, at least for us, the Shoshone-Bannock tribes in Idaho don't feel that the Bureau of Land Management is really a good trustee of the tribes. So. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I'm, I'm nodding not uh, as, uh, as acknowledgement. I hear what you're saying. Um, I, I'm going to put on my technical hat and say that I just get to deal with legal descriptions. <laughs> And that is what I'm hoping that I can help you guys out with today, um, not being able to repair uh, any, anything that has happened, but uh, moving forward from here, how do we, take, how do we uh, deal with land descriptions, legal descriptions in a way that can be helpful, that is uh, results in something that is meaningful, useful uh, for what you guys are trying to accomplish. Ah, so accurate legal descriptions, absolutely very important. Uh, let's see. Ah, so let's just jump right into when you are writing a land description. Um, the book that I'm, so I have some specifications. We had that slide up earlier. Uh, and our specifications for descriptions of land, we have these hard copy available at our booth uh, for you to uh, have a copy with you to take home. And this is where I get a lot of my slide and my information for this presentation. I recognize that writing land descriptions in a manner in accordance with the specification guidelines is for very specific uses. Um, if you're doing any fee to trust transactions, uh, certain specific transactions require that the land descriptions fall in accordance with the specification guidelines. Not everything you do has to be in accordance with specification guidelines. So understand that there's uh, un making sure of the project that you're working on, what are you trying to accomplish? Uh, some of your land descriptions might not have to go to the full extreme that I'm going to be talking about today, but I'm gonna talk about it so that you guys are aware of it, so that whenever you do uh, any sort of fee-to-trust transactions or um, writing land descriptions with the BIA or the BLM, that you're not caught by surprise that these things are required. Uh, so, required elements of a land description. Principal meridian and state must be noted. Uh, whenever we're writing land descriptions for that final transaction, we make sure that the principal meridian is spelled out fully and that the state is indicated. Uh, a lot of us, like if I'm doing my draft records or if I've got my cuff records, my notes that I'm going, I'll use a lot of abbreviations um, and that's totally fine. But when I get to that final description, I'm going to be writing my principal meridian spelled out fully, including the state, including my township and range with the proper punctuation and abbreviations. And I've got a slide that will go through that. The section number, aliquot parts and lots, and then any irregular parcels. That seems kind of straightforward. Are there any questions on that? Uh, the slides should be available, yeah. I've, um, I've submitted them, but I noticed that they were not on the website last time I checked, but um, things happen quickly in technology too, so they might be available now. Um, but also my contact information, I'll have cards too. If, um, if for some reason there's complication, contact me directly and I'll get you the slide deck. 
Uh, so I'm just terminology here to talk about, just to make sure, because we have such a wide variety of understandings, people that work with this on a regular basis, versus people who uh, just very limitedly uh, work with these, so some terminology. Our public land survey system, uh, I think I'm biased. I'm a surveyor, I'm definitely biased. I think it's a beautiful system. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you came to my house, you would see that I decorate in squares. Uh, I don't do... I don't do shapes, I don't do colors, it's a lot of squares. Um, just like our public land survey system. Uh, so everything within our public land survey system can be uniquely described, and that helps eliminate ambiguity, uh, and it helps eliminate boundary disputes whenever we can uniquely describe parcels um, and, and there's not some conflict there. Uh, townships are numbered consecutively north and south of the baseline. Uh, so you see we've got the baseline on there. And above that baseline, there are townships north. Below it are our townships south. Uh, and then we have our principal meridian labeled on there. On the east of those principal meridian are our ranges east. West of that principal meridian are our ranges west. Uh, and then let me just check my notes here. So in order to lay flat squares on a mostly round earth, um, there are correction lines, and that's what's shown on the slide here is our, second, or our standard parallels. When you come to those standard parallels, um, so most of our townships look like these nice squares, and all of the township corners line up, um, and they, they, they kind of fit together nicely. But sometimes you'll look at maps, and the township to the south does not have matching section corners, matching uh, quarter corners, et cetera. And when that occurs, you're probably on one of these correction lines, uh, one of these standard parallels. Just information, that is designed so that we can continue to lay squares, as many as we can, on the flat earth. And that where you start to see that curvature, where you start to see that show up mathematically, is about every four townships, Townships are six miles across, so about every 24 miles is when mathematically we start seeing the curvature, we start seeing the convergence, um, and so that's where you'll see your standard parallels. Our township, uh, most people are familiar with what a township is, six miles across uh, with 36 sections inside of it labeled uh, one through 36 uh, in a kind of snake pattern uh, is called blastophredomic. It means as the ox plows. Uh, so we numbered our sections as the ox plows. Aliquot subdivisions. Uh, so this diagram just shows common subdivision breakdowns by halves and by quarters. Uh, aliquot is a French word, and it means to divide equally. So when you uh, create an aliquot description from a public land survey plat, then the intent is that they will be divided equally, that there will be no gaps, no overlaps in between the parcels, uh, that it will have a simultaneous concurrent line. And lotting and aliquot subdivisions. Uh, so within this section, this is uh, section six within a township. So because mathematically we have the convergence, we have excess and deficiency, uh, the surveyor's job is to lay as many squares down on the ground as possible. And then mathematically we put all of that error in the north and western tiers. And so this is a pretty common. It, we can put that error in other places as well. Um, you'll find it uh, other places. but. Typically, this is what you'll find, where you'll have lotting on the north and the west tiers of a section. And we also have aliquot relations within this township, or within this section as well. You see indicated by the 40 acres, 80 acres, and 160 acres. The biggest thing I want you to walk away from about aliquots and lots, if it's not already in your back pocket, is that aliquots and lots do not get along. They are cats and dogs. They are oil and vinegar. Um, they cannot mix. So if you have a lot, then you, it needs to be described as a lot. Um, once you start breaking down lots using aliquot terms, saying by halves or by quarters, um, it gets really messy. Uh, and so the same thing is when, with, when you have an aliquot part, when you start treating it like a lot, kind of giving it um, a meets and bounds description around the outside, 
you start to create some gaps and some overlaps and you create problems within the system that you never intended to, you never anticipated, um, but the way the system is designed is that it causes trouble. And the best way I can illustrate that is uh, when we're talking about lots. So let's say uh, in any of those lots up there, I'll just pick lot one. Uh, a couple common ways to divide lots is by um, distance or by acres. So if we took lot one and we subdivided lot one in half by acreage and we built a fence because that's our property, uh, and then we have the same lot one and we subdivide that by distance and we built a fence there, those two fences are not in the same location. That might be kind of complicated. Does anyone have any questions? The, the biggest takeaway I want you to have is that lots and aliquots don't mix. You have, to treat the, the, you have to treat each one uniquely with their own kind of set of rules with them. Okay, and our typical regular section, right? We've, I put up all these nice squares up there, um, show how wonderfully the system fits together, um, and we all know that in reality, this is what our maps look like. Um, and so some interesting th things happen though. So a typical or regular section, I'll re I'll, I use that term a lot, regular section. When I say regular, I'm implying a whole bunch of survey rules, a whole bunch of principles that apply to our survey system. And, uh, but in fact, it might look like this. The sides of those sections might not be a full mile. Um, if we go between the quarter corners, it, it's probably not exactly a half mile, uh, et cetera. Who's, who's more familiar with their sections looking like these? I see, I see some hands. Any questions? Okay, well now you all will have my number after this, so whenever you guys do have questions, feel free to call me. One of my superpowers is that I uh, can connect you to a local person. So if you maybe have a question and say, I, I really I have a question on this, I, um, man, the way that we work today, we don't really have time to stumble anymore, right? We don't really have a lot of time just to sit and figure it out. Um, so if you say, I really have a question, I want an answer, I need a contact, and you're not sure who to call, you've got my contact information now. You can send me a message, and I try very hard not to answer everything myself. I want to get you connected to your local surveyor, to a, your bill surveyor, to a CFED surveyor, somebody who is local that you can, make, can, can create a relationship with um, to help answer all the questions. Okay, let's talk a little bit about 303 DM7. So the Department of Interior Standards for Indian Trust Land Boundary Evidence. Uh, who in here is familiar with 303 DM7? You might be familiar with, you might be familiar with uh, what it is in, in concept. We might just not use the same terminology um, that we do because I'm a Fed. Uh, I speak in acronyms all the time, so I refer to this as the 303DM7. Uh, but the reason I want to make sure that each of you are familiar with it, I'm going to go to my notes to make sure I don't miss anything, um, is that so 303DM7 applies to all fee-to-trust transactions, which is really what I'm here talking about when it comes to land descriptions. Uh, so the standards, I'm just going to kind of read through my notes because I don't want to miss anything. The standards require both boundary and title evidence to be examined in totality for conflict-free land boundaries. Boundary evidence is examined to identify insufficient descriptions, ambiguous boundary locations, conflicts in use, unauthorized encroachments, boundary gaps and overlaps, and other conflicts around boundary lines. Uh, so really what we're trying to do, you know, we're trying to create a stable land tenure system, a stable understanding of boundaries. Um, and so using the 303 DM7, it's a process to help us achieve that. 
Uh, we want to make sure that we're relying on both title evident and boundary evident, and that's kind of what uh, the 303 DM7 does. It meshes the two of those together to look at all aspects of that description. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, but not so much anymore. Is that correct? Uh, so are you referring to the new directive, the BIA directive? Uh, so there is a, a BIA directive out I've, in the presentation I do tomorrow. I talk a little bit more about that specifically. There is, uh, yes, so to answer your question, there is a directive right now that no longer requires the land description review as part of the process. Um, doesn't mean that land descriptions aren't <laughs> part of the process. It just uh, takes out uh, this piece of the of 303 DM7. However, all of these tools and resources, the surveyors, the, the, the specification, so the, the requirements of the land description don't change just because we don't have to have perhaps this land description review piece of it anymore. However, all the bill surveyors and the CFED, CFED surveyors are still available to help with that process. Different regions are handling it differently. <laughs> BLM has cadastral authority, and is that not what we're doing with Feed of Trust as a cadastral description? Where's Chris at? I'm going to put, I'm going to throw Chris under the bus. <laughs> um, okay, so ask your question. You're, you're asserting that cadastral is part of the process? Okay, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk a very tight rope when it comes to this topic and just make sure that everyone in here is aware that Cadastral wants to be a partner in the process. Um, we understand that the, the directive exists. Um, we will, uh, we're partners along with it. Um, but at the end of the day, a legal description is still required, and we want to be able to help. And then we want to make sure that you guys are educated in writing a proper land description that has all the required elements. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything from my notes. I think I got, I think I got most of it. Any questions? <clears throat> oh, sorry, you want to ask the question? I just was wondering if, uh, so we're told we're from Alaska. Okay. And at um, BIA, there is no longer funding for cadastral surveys. Okay, well, when it comes to, I'm very familiar with Alaska, so I've got a whole bunch of questions about which part of the program. <laughs> um, as it relates to, uh, to BIA, um, I, I would say uh, funding and government is always fickle. Um, so I'm gonna careful to dance around any questions relating to funding, but I, a recognition that um, yeah, it is, it is kind of tricky. I don't want to overstep um, something that anybody may have told you, but um, I also know that cadastral surveyors are very creative and resourceful. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, the, this next slide here, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but the bottom piece of it is part of the, the form response from 303DM7 which indicates what sort of risk level exists with the transaction being done and the land description associated with it. And so the big thing that I want you to take away from this is that uh, when a description is submitted for review, these are the types of things that are being looked at by, from, the, from the surveyor's perspective. Is the description unambiguous? Uh, is the location locatable? Can we go out there and find it on the ground? Uh, will future surveyors agree? Uh, we we kind of joke amongst ourselves that if you get four surveyors in a room, you're going to get five opinions. Um, and so will surveyors agree amongst themselves that there is a complete uh, locatable description out there? Will the courts agree? Yeah, we're definitely trying to look forward and, and that as well, making sure that we're making good decisions um, that aren't going to end up with anybody in litigation. Um, and then unwritten rights, um, those are hard to track down sometimes, but something that we do uh, make an attempt to identify uh, while we're looking through those land descriptions. But the biggest thing is that these are risk assessments. These are opinions. These are looking at the evidence in front of you and determining the risk. Is this a high risk? 
type of transaction? Is this a low risk type of transaction for the goal that you're trying to achieve? Okay, I'm gonna go back up to my computer now. This is, this part's the kind of boring. I'm sorry. Okay, is that big enough for everyone to see both sides? Okay. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of go through this a little bit and just talk about those required elements that are part. When I teach this class in the longer format, we have a lot of practice. And I wanted to integrate some of that practice in with you guys today just so that you could see it um, so that whenever you sit down to write yours, it doesn't seem so unfamiliar. The way I describe land descriptions, um, anything cadastro really, is like it's a second language. Um, it looks like English, right? It looks, feels, acts like English, but it's not. It's like a dialect. It's like, you know, if you grew up in the north and then you go down uh, in the south and they're speaking English, but they have an accent to it and it's a little bit harder to understand. That's exactly how I describe land descriptions, legal descriptions. It's English, but it's, it's, it's has its own accent to it. So uh, this example that I have up here is one of the examples in the specification guidelines. And we'll just go through it. And really, you just, you just gotta start, whoops. First of all, I gotta click the right button. Oh, I guess I can't do it. Okay, punt. Okay, I'm gonna punt that one because it's not working for me and I'm not gonna make you suffer through it. Uh, but uh, what I do when I do the training is I pull up a Word document and we just type it all out, uh, type it all out as it's shown there. So the points that I'll go over for you guys, uh, the principal meridian and the state, principal meridian must be spelled out fully in your final legal description. If you're doing your temporary ones, if you're doing notes for your file, I would probably write 4THPM, completely fine. But when I am getting ready to write this description in my final document, I'm making sure to follow these rules. Uh, township and range, the proper uh, punctuations and abbreviations are shown up on the screen. Those periods and commas are so important. Um, many of you might have in your office someone we call, we call them a comma queen. Um, I know that I am one of them. Uh, so I, I don't find the term offensive. If you have a comma queen in your office, make friends with them. They will spot these commas. I can't catch a misspelled word to save my life. You miss a comma, it will stick out to me like a sore thumb. So if you have a comma queen in your office and you're writing your land descriptions, make friends with them, ask them to review it, um, and they will help you out. Uh, we do a section, uh, so we, uh, and there's more, just more examples in our specification guidelines, uh, but our, the next line is indented. Um, some, some offices, I teach it as three spaces over or five spaces over. As long as there's a visual indentation, it is a visual break there. Um, and then the lands that you're describing, followed by the acreage statement. Uh, we, I have some acreage slides in here, so I'll, I won't speak about that so much anymore. But these are, you know, obviously this is a very short, simple description, but does anyone have any questions about what this looks like, required elements, formatting? Okay. Oh. Slides ago, you said they're recording this, so I'm going to give you this. A, a couple slides ago, when you were talking about regular sections, and it said it's rarely ever a mile long. It rarely ever equals 640 acres. Why bring in the um, confusion of saying it's 160 acres when likely it's not? Gotcha. So uh, I'll give you my surveyor perspective answer from that which is that, um, so often that 160 acres, I've heard it referred to as like the government acreage or the platted acreage. And when you have an acreage that is an aliquot, then rules of surveying apply. So we can subdivide it. We're not, you can get a group of people together and they're going to understand the principles of how to manage, how to subdivide, 
how to describe those lands. Whenever, as soon as we break it apart, um, it can have actual, you know, when we do resurvey, sometimes we might need to give an actual acreage because we're doing leasing and we might have some um, royalties associated with that that we want to have actual acreages. So there's a distinction between what is actual or resurveyed acreage versus what is the platted acreage. Um, and the key, I'm going to circle myself back a little bit though, whenever we are writing a land description for a transaction, it is based upon likely a record or a plat that's associated with that. So the acreage that you're going to use is going to be whatever is on the plat. So for this one, that plat, oops, let me go back. For this one, the plat specifically says 160 acres. Um, if I were using a different record that were a resurvey that we change, the um, cadastral records do not change acreages on resurveys unless it changes by 5%. Um, and the reason we do that, it comes to stability and boundaries. If we start changing, you know, by tenths or hundreds of acres or just, you know, a, a few acres here and there, it creates a lot of uncertainty and a lot of instability. Um, and that doesn't feel good. <laughs> Um, when the actual boundaries on the ground, the occupation doesn't change regardless of what that acreage number is. Does that help you understand? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, we're gonna talk about preferred order next. When we are writing land descriptions, uh, we're normally in our sections. And so the preferred order for writing them is from the northeast, northwest, southwest, southeast. Um, and we'll get into some examples pretty soon here. We'll kind of practice that a little bit. Um, and then interior to that also, so the, uh, the larger pink numbers, those are the preferred order. And if we had lands only within that northeast quadrant that we needed to write, we still follow that same preferred order procedure using those smaller red numbers. Um, and I've got a slide here real quick that shows that as an example. Uh, so this is my slide here. So for preferred order, we start in that northeast quadrant. Um, and so we're going to put on the screen here description of the lands that are highlighted in blue. So that entire northeast quadrant is colored in blue. So we can just call that our northeast quadrant. And then we follow that by a comma when we're writing this land description. Commas mean and the. So the northeast quarter and the, um, whoops, let me go back. The next piece we have in our northwest quarter, we see we only have that top uh, northern half shaded in blue. So that's the only part that we need to write. So the way that I write these actually is I start from my larger parcel to my smaller parcel. And I'll explain it here on the screen. So my larger parcel is my northwest quadrant. So I'll write northwest quadrant. And then I would give a small space in front of that, and then I'll write what my actual description is. So for this one, it is the north half. So it reads the north half of the northwest quadrant. But when I write it, um, the way that my brain works, it's a little easier to teach, is when you start from that larger parcel and give yourself a little space and put that smaller one in front of it, it sometimes helps with, especially when you drill down and you're writing super complicated descriptions. So we have our northeast and our northwest parcels described. And so in following proper order, we move down to our southwest parcel. And we only have that northeast quarter of that southwest parcel. So again, oh, I forgot my comma. And the, uh, I give myself some room here. So I do my larger parcel again, my southwest quarter, that larger parcel. And then right in front of it, I write what's highlighted in blue, which is the northeast quarter. So it reads the northeast quarter of the southwest quarter. So we have northeast, northwest, southwest described. We only have one more, our southeast quarter. It is completely in blue. That dang comma. They're all over. Add the comma. And our southeast quarter is fully highlighted in blue, so we can write that whole quarter. And then this is the end of the description, so we finish it with a period. We're gonna get some practice on this. 
Uh, okay, acreage calculation. Uh, the biggest thing I guess I want to point out on this slide, so is those area relationships, those aliquot part relationships. Again, if imagine this section were not square, that it has those skews in it, it has those flares in it. It looks kind of like the one that we had on the slide, uh, a few when it had the typical regular section. These same rules apply as long as your acreages show your aliquot acreages. Uh, so we take our full section of 160 acres and we divide that into quadrants. It's, it's red, hopefully you guys can kind of see that annotation up there. Um, and so this is why, if anyone ever read the field notes and you have our section quarters and we have our quarter, quarter, quarter corners that are at half miles, has anyone ever been confused by that? Why are they called quarter corners? Because when you subdivide your section, it divides into quarters. So we call them our quarter corners. Uh, so we have our full section divided into quarters, so 640 acres divided into quarters that uh, lands us with our 160 acre quarter parcels. Most descriptions that are written are typically at this level or at the 40 acre level. Uh, breaking that 160 acres down again, we get into our 16th uh, acre, 16th corners, um, and each of those parcels are 40 acres. We can break down those 40 acre parcels one more, another time, down in that uh, southeast of the southeast, uh, and those are 10 acres. These are our 64th parcels. And we have one other legal subdivision that can be done, if you guys can see it down there in that south. I'm not gonna try it. <laughs> those uh, two and a half acre parcels. This is the last legal subdivision that can be done uh, on a cadastral plat, on an aliquot plat. Anything below two and a half acres has to be uh, done with a survey. Um, okay, any questions on that? Got one more slide on acreage. The, this slide just kind of um, speaks for itself. I don't need to read it to you. One trick that I want to tell you though um, that I learned recently, after 24 years in the Bureau, you still get to learn some new tricks. Um, sometimes when, uh, if you have aliquot subdivisions like this, uh, somebody taught me that you can take, so the, the halves, you can read those as divide by, and so you take a whole section, 640 acres, and then you just put in your calculator, you can do divide by two, divide by four, and you'll get 80 acres. Um, so that's been a, a new trick I've been using real quick uh, to do acreage calculations uh, real quickly on the fly. Anybody have any questions on acreage calculations? I know I'm kind of blowing through this, this material a little bit quickly, so if you need me to slow down or you have any questions, um, feel free to interrupt and ask, um, or also you can, uh, I'll be here, uh, I'll be here all week. You guys can come ask me at the table. So let's do a, a quick, this is where you guys get a help out here. Um, when I teach these, uh, normally I teach them virtually on Zoom. We get a lot of interaction, a lot of people practicing. Uh, so in this exercise here, we have a land description that was given to us, and the areas highlighted in yellow are for the transaction that we need to write up. And so we're gonna write this land description together. So when we write our land description, we start with those required elements. Those first required elements, does anyone remember what they were? Northeast. Uh, northeast, start in the northeast quadrant, I agree, but we're not there yet. We need some principal meridian. There we go. So we start with our principal meridian and state, fully spelled out, including the state. We follow that with our township and range, making sure that we're using proper punctuation uh, and abbreviations. This is section three. So we're gonna add in our SEC three. Uh, when, we, when you do this, on uh, most of you are probably using Microsoft Word, uh, the S, you type in SEC and you put in your period, it will make that S uppercase. It will do the autocorrect. So you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to that. Uh, proper legal description, it is a lowercase s. So you have to go back and change that to a lowercase s. 
Um, you can set up your autocorrect. There's a whole bunch of tips and tricks that you can do to avoid having to do that every single time, but it is something to watch out for. Uh, so we have our section three. I condensed this on our slide here because uh, of spacing, so hopefully you guys will get to understand. So now we have to start writing our descriptions, those parcels that are in yellow. So where do you guys want to start? We have aliquots to write and we have lots to write. Which one goes first? Who says lots? I see some hands. Who said we start with our aliquots? I see a hand. I cheated a little bit because it's on the screen. <laughs> Uh, according to our specification guidelines here, when we have aliquots and lots within our section, we describe the lots first, irregardless of where they lay. So we could have a lot down here where it says G, we would still describe that lot first. So we're gonna type in our lot, uh, lowercase l. So now that we have our lot described, now we can start describing our aliquot par parcels here. So. Up front, it said, we said we needed to start in our northeast quadrant. I agree. We have our lot described. We can now describe what is up there as parcel B. Who wants to tell me the land description for parcel B? Somebody yell it out to me. Southeast. Southeast quarter of the northeast quarter? Yep, I agree. One thing when you're writing legal descriptions too to be mindful of is the one slash fours or one slash twos. Um, I'm always very careful to elongate those uh, as it's shown up on here. They will also sometimes show up as fractions. Sometimes our Word, our Microsoft Word or something will, will think for us and it will make it a fraction, a one over four or a one over two. I always recommend that you change it to so that it's elongated. The reason we do that is because these descriptions get reproduced a lot. Um, so if you have, if it's recorded, uh, let's say it's recorded in a recording office, the um, pixelization might not be that great. You print out a copy to put in your records. Somebody needs a copy of that, you make a copy. All of a sudden, it's not too many more copies down the line that those numbers are really hard to read. And so one way to reduce interpretation error, to reduce ambiguity going down the line is to write them out fully, the one slash four and the one slash two. So we have our lots described. We have our northeast quadrant described. Oh, question. The lot three. So, uh, in, because the areas highlighted in yellow are the description that we are writing. And so the lot three up here is highlighted in yellow. So we're including that in our description. Up on that northern tier, it has lots one through four. And so lot three is highlighted, so we're making sure that we include that in our description. Did that help answer? Okay, excellent. So we have our lots, our northeast quadrant. So now we can move over to our northwest quadrant. Who wants to shout out the land description for the land identified as D? I heard some, what did they say? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what he said. Oh, okay. <laughs> The east half of the northwest quarter. Thank you. I, I, and um, so I'm going to use this as an opportunity to say to remind. So this is where the lot and the aliquot parts they do not get along. They are cats and dogs. They're oil and vinegar. We cannot combine those. So we have our lot three described already, and that helps take care of the lots piece. And now we can describe our aliquot piece only in D, which is gonna be the southeast quarter of the northwest quarter. But it is very deceptive and it is very tricky. So um, it's just one thing to be mindful of. Yes, ma'am. I still don't understand what you said about lot three. Sorry guys, I live and breathe this and sometimes you just gotta ask me a couple of times for me to catch in. Um, so, is my pointer showing up? Let me see, pointer, laser pointer, there we go. So up on the northern tier 
of this example uh, exercise that we have up here, we have lots one through four. So that corresponds to the slide that I had earlier where surveyors, we put all the excess and deficiency in our northern and western tiers. It can go other places, but that's the most commonly where you're gonna find it. So in this description, um, they wanted to include the area in lot three, um, and that's why it's highlighted in yellow. Does that help out where the lot three comes from? Okay, thank you so much. I apologize for taking, taking a step to understand the question. Am I doing on time? Okay, so we have our lot, oh, another question? It's not a question, it's a comment. Uh, the the uh, four lots up on top are already named. That Those are their names, yes. okay? Section three, the ones below, they are a portion of the section, so that's why they're separated. Uh, the first ones, of course, are the lots, like you explained, but the other ones that, uh, that are below those lots, those are portions of the section, which is the name of itself, and that's why, it, that's the difference between those. Yeah, yeah, thank you, that was good. Um, good clarification, did everybody understand that? Okay, so yeah, uh, the, so the lots are named, whoa, I got that way too close, so the lots are named, um, and so they're given, they're given descriptions. The other parcels, which I have identified as these letter identifiers, those are aliquot parcels. That's what we described as our, um, in our quadrant, um, our, our quadrant description. So we have to name them. A question? The letter descriptions are really for this example. The letter description. Yeah, the letter descriptions are only for this exercise. Yeah. Oh, excuse me, folks. If you're not used to looking at surveys, if you look at page eight in the guide, it kind of shows people like the different quarter. That that's clearer to me than. What oh, okay. Don't you think, like, yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, those of you who have a specification guideline available to you um, to look at right now, on page eight, the diagram at the bottom has a different um, picture uh, d that kind of describes how aliquot and lots can interact with each other. Um, yeah, what's up on the screen here is purely for exercise, um, and the letter descriptors are just identified so that we can have the same conversation, because if I start saying the northwest quarter of the southeast quarter, I'm gonna lose a lot of you guys pretty quick, but if I say parcel E, then we can have, then we each follow. Uh, okay, so, in writing our land description, following proper order, we have our lot described, we have our northeast quadrant described, we have our northwest quadrant described, and so now we can describe the lands in our southwest quadrant. So this is uh, what's in is E, F, G, and H. And when we describe interior to those quadrants, we still follow proper order. So we're still gonna describe these parcels in E, F, G, and H order. But we only have E, F, and H highlighted to be described. When we write our aliquot descriptions, we try to combine them uh, into larger parcels where we can. So in this case, we can combine E and F as the north half of that southwest quadrant. And then we have E and F described, and now we can add in H, which is that southeast quarter of the southwest quadrant. Question. Would it ever be correct to say the north half of the south half of section three? I'm gonna, did everyone see my soapbox? I'm gonna jump up on my soapbox real quick. Um, half of half descriptions. No, no, I'd like you to get rid of that. Um, don't, please don't. Uh, you can, you can, and it is done. It is common, you probably have run into descriptions that are half of half, north half of the south half, east half of the west half, etc. cetera. Um, when you do that though, you're unintentionally causing some ambiguity in that description and that's what we're trying to avoid. So that's the same thing as that fence example that I went to. So if we do the, the north half of the north half and we drew in, um, and they meant by acreage and we build a fence out there, dividing that parcel with putting that fence half by acreage and then we build another fence that's half by distance, 
they are not the same vent. There are two different definitions of that boundary, and that's what we're trying to avoid. If you do a half of half description, um, there is guidance in our specification guidelines that have a clarify, clarifying statement that we ask that you add. So if you do a half of half description, and that is what you're carrying forward, that's okay. We understand that there are some circumstances where that happens. Please add the clarifying statement, which tells the next person how you intend for it to be interpreted. We don't want them to guess. We don't want to argue about where that fence is going to be in the future when all we have to do is add a simple little line in there that says, this is how we intend for you to interpret that. Um, yeah, I definitely recommend um, for our BLM land descriptions when we come across something that is half of half um, for a lease or for some sort of update, we're trying to update those descriptions so that we eliminate that ambiguity. Um, so that's, that's, I'll jump off of my soapbox now on half of halves. So what would be an example of how you would clarify, you know, half of half? So if, um, so, uh, to clear, so to not do half of half descriptions, you have to break it down into the quarters. So if it were the north half of the northeast quarter, I would do the north half of the northeast of the northeast and the north half of the northwest of the northeast. Um, and I know it gets really confusing when I'm just spouting those out um, and a picture would be very helpful. Um, so I can draw you a picture after. <laughs> after any, anybody else who'd like to have that picture. Um, but basically the short answer is that you break it up into that smaller quadrants um, so that you're no longer having to do the halves of halves, that you can break it down in the quarters. Would it be acceptable if there was no lots on the northern boundary because then there would be no ambiguity? The ambiguity still exists. So the question was uh, if there were no lots, could you still do half of half? But the situation still exists. You, um, you would still have two different definitions of what half means. So if you intended it by half of half by acreage, and I went out and surveyed it, and I did it half by distance, I just did not put down on the ground what you intended that description to be. And so it's what we're trying to avoid is that ambiguity. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The clarifying statement is you're telling them what the intent is. You're telling them how you want it to be interpreted in the future and not leaving it up. Question. Lot one. Yes, sir. 39.87. Is that acres? Yes. Okay. So how can you do, how can you determine to find, you want to find one acre? Uh, to do so in order to write a description for one acre that's in that lot um, We would either be with a meets and bounds description or a survey that subdivided that property uh, into those smaller parcels Yeah, for those who didn't uh, hear Chris loud enough He was just saying that um, the BLM booth is right out the door and to the right and we did bring with us a whole bunch of specification guidelines no, no, you're fine. Oh, okay, I'll hear, I'll, I'll, I'll relay, I'll relay. Um, I'm a lender, so how do we, when we get legal descriptions from the tribe, how do we know that that's the right legal description to use for the mortgage? How do we, do you hear that question, Chris? That's, that is a very good question. So, so the, hold on, the, so the question is, uh, as a lender, let's say you get a description from, uh, from a, a client, how do you know that that is adequate? There, there should be a whole lot of information that comes with that, a chain of title, how they've gotten it, how, how we've yes. Got the we've got the lease, but our mortgage doesn't match. The legal description. It, it should match. <laughs> so, and and it, that would have to go back and work with LTRO or Realty to get that resolved, but that unfortunately but no, happens a lot. <laughs> one of those, one of those impossible questions. Yeah, I, 
I, I like to describe it as a puzzle. I love putting puzzles together. Some people find puzzles very infuriating, right? But you need all of the pieces to be able to see that big picture. And that's how I describe a little bit of this. So like you've got the puzzle, you're just missing a piece. Um, and maybe that piece is a question that you need to ask. Maybe it's a document that you need to find, but you need all of those pieces in order to put that full puzzle together. What if what the TSR says and then what we feel our acreage is as a tribe is off? So how do we dispute what the BIA has in their TAMs? Can we get our own? Could that, can we get our own CFIPS and then dispute that? Because when I've asked, they said that we need a cadastral survey. Well, we know you guys don't have the funding for that. Yeah. Yes, so it would have to go through the process of you know, federally recognized survey to change that acreage. And I see some of the people in the room that we've actually done that for. So, yes. So if we have a CFED say that maybe we have, we pay for our own CFED to go look and say, maybe there's 160 acres, but there's only 60 in TAMS, we could send that to the BIA and they would update LTRO without you guys having to get a cadastral survey on it, correct? You would have to work with BLM to get that done because there is a process to go through that. Um, one of the steps, part, part of that is the CFED's mm -hmm. survey, but they have to work under a special authority to do that. So, so it's, it is possible. You would work with your through your bills to get that done, and he's retiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. so, so the question is, what happens if you have a, a, a survey and the acreage doesn't match up in in TAMS, and how do we resolve this? And in the case that was described, is that they are able to get a new survey done. Um, and so they went through a CFES to get a new survey done, and how does that process work? Really, that process is a relationship. Oh, and we... Another thing that's important to understand is there's a difference between uh, measurements and intent. Yes. Okay, measurements are not, you know, um, typically do not, you know, just because of different surveyors measuring, but there's a difference between those two. Uh, and that's probably where a lot of the confusion not is. You know, that's how uh, acreage is different, but not by very much. Yeah, yeah. And acreage, uh, from a surveyor's perspective, um, so imagine, you know, you've got a, a hierarchy. Um, you know, like, it's it's triage, you know? When someone gets hurt, you know, uh, are, they, are they bleeding? Where are they bleeding? How much? You know, things like that. For, um, for acreage, uh, when it comes to uh, surveying and, and hierarchy of evidence, acreage is at the very bottom. We're more concerned with actual occupation on the ground. Where do the monuments, where are those boundaries, um, where does the protection need to occur? And the acreage, um, that is, that's pretty subsequent to all that other information. So it's very valuable, it causes a lot of trouble, but um, it comes down to, you know, really what it was uh, Andrew was saying about, you know, what is the intent? Lou's, did you hear that question? I didn't hear that, and that was when I was coming up. Can you repeat the question so they can I, hear that? Yeah, that I, I know, I need to, I, I do need to, I need to get closer to you. My, my hearing is going in my, you, I'm hiding all my, my white and gray hairs. <laughs> Ask the question for me again, please. Okay, I was asking about how do you lose the trust identity because of um, our BLM guy says, make sure your legal is accurate and right, after, you know, or else you lose your trust identity. Oh, okay, the trust identity. Chris, do you, are you aware of that? Uh, it's a, a, assigning, a, a, assigning a, a trust, assignment, a trust identity to that land description. Hmm, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna have to think on that question. I'm gonna, she stumped me. She stumped me and I'm gonna have to think on that question. The question was uh, about a land description that was inadequate and, uh, and somebody saying if it's an inadequate description then you lose a trust identity. I can't say I've ever, um, encountered that, so you stumped me, and I will, I will find some, I will find some answers. Uh, okay, another question back here. I'm getting my steps in. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Coming, coming back to this here, um, when we're describing the southwest quarter. Yeah. 
Uh, uh, would it be acceptable to be to say the southwest quarter minus the southwest quarter of the southwest quarter? So the question is, if we're describing that southwest quarter, can we use an accepting clause? Can we say the southwest quarter except that land's described in parcel G? You can. You can. It is more preferred to make a description for what the lands actually are as opposed to what they are not. Um, there's going to be a lot more clarity in describing what actually is. Um, so accepting descriptions are adequate, um, but it, is, it would be less preferred than just describing what the land actually are. Uh, okay, let me finish this one. Uh, and then uh, finally, we fin so we, to finish our order northeast, northwest, southwest, southeast, then we finish off with our north half of that southeast quarter. Um, and then we can calculate acreage. For this one, because this is a regular section, each of those squares that are highlighted in yellow are 40 acres each. I think there's seven of them. So you take seven times 40, and then you add the lot acreage as well um, to get your total acreage. I think I probably have like 10 more slides left and we are way out of time. So <laughs> um, let me see what else I want to leave you guys with. A couple of common errors that you might find. Um, your townships or your ranges being off, a, thir a 13 east instead of a 3 east, um, that, that gives you a 60 mile discrepancy. That might cause some trouble. Um, curve to the left versus curve to the right causes some trouble. Some other common uh, errors actually found in description. Um, these are what I call fast finger errors. Um, sometimes our fingers work faster than our, than our minds do, um, and they work pretty independently. So when we type out descriptions and we make some errors like this, uh, we can cause a lot of trouble in those descriptions. Uh, and just a couple more examples. So uh, this one, we go through some errors. Let's see, Chris. Chris snuck out on me. Um, so for those of you who want to make the transition and to break time, um, please feel free to get up and do that. And um, for those of you who want to stay and chat about some more common errors, I'll keep uh, going through this slide for those of you who are uh, interested in this. And if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to come visit our booth. And I think that there are evaluation sheets that were handed out to everybody. Uh, feedback is always very welcome. So for those of you that are hanging in with me, um, and want to look at some more common errors that you can find in land descriptions. Uh, on this slide, every single line has an error in it. So for this very first one, it is this fifth principal meridian. When we're writing our descriptions, we want to make sure that they are spelled out fully. Uh, so if you're giving a description to review, these are some pretty common things that you'll find. So we we'll want to spell out our fifth principal meridian. And our second line here, our township and range, we have missed a comma. So again, we're gonna go and make friends with our comma queen and uh, make sure that we have all of our commas. This next line here, our section six, uh, this one is adequately described. The lands are described properly, but they are not in proper order. We would want to describe our northwest quadrant before our southwest quadrant. So making sure that we're following our proper order is really important. Uh, in our next line, we are simply missing the semicolon at the end. Uh, again, very common things that are discovered when you're reviewing land descriptions. In our section 17 line, there's this big space in the middle. Uh, and that can get really confusing. And this one, this is another one of my fast finger errors. Uh, and so it should be the west half of that southwest quarter. But that space, you know, during a review, someone might, might want to put a comma in there or put an and. And that could really cause some trouble because the west half and the southwest quarter is very different than the west half of the southwest quarter. Uh, the next one, section 18, this is where the Microsoft Word turned it into a fraction, and we want to make sure that we elongate that so that it is very clear and we get rid of some of those transposition or interpretation errors 
and future times. And the last one is simply this period. And the, the last one here, uh, I wish I had a chance to address this with many people, but there's two acreage statements that you're going to encounter with land descriptions. Area described and areas aggregate um, are the two area descriptions that are used with land. Uh, and there's a question over here. Oh, excuse me, my allergies are going crazy, so okay. my apologies. I read it, I read legals um, that read just the SW, uh, NW, whatever, and then I've read them all the way out where it says Southwest Northwest Quarters. Is it preference? Is there a rule? So, so the question is, uh, you know, sometimes we encounter descriptions that just have the letter designators and not the halves or the quarters. When you encounter that, um, I've, we do encounter that. I use that a lot for my cuff records. We use a lot of that for our land database in, uh, systems. Um, the LR2000 that the BLM uses does not, the system does not allow for, for halves and quarters, right? So we're kind of limited by the technology there. Um, when you are writing a description for a final conveyance for that final transaction, you always want to include that full description with your halves and your quarters. Um, uh, as it's up here? Oh, spelled out, spelled out. Uh, this, what I have up on the screen is what is in the specification guidelines. So this is what is preferred when you are writing descriptions in accordance with the specification guidelines. I always like to put that caveat because we do a lot of things that have a lot more flexibility in them. So depending on the goal you are trying to achieve, is it clear, uh, is it unambiguous? Uh, you know, is it, um, people aren't gonna argue about it. If it meets those goals, then it's acceptable. Yeah, if we're gonna write it in, uh, if I'm publishing it in a federal register for some sort of action, it's gonna look like what's on the screen. Go ahead. Do we have to write out section two? I notice you have that abbreviated. So section is uh, the, what's shown up on the screen. The question is uh, the abbreviation for section and what is on the screen is the common abbreviation for section. Okay, so we can put that in Yep. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that concludes this slide. And I think I've just, oh, aggregate, sorry. Yeah, and then I just have a demonstration of plotting. Um, thank you guys for hanging in with me. Uh, apologies for starting a little bit late, and I appreciate that you guys hung with me. Um, I do have some business cards. We've got more of specification guidelines. I am here uh, until we close up on Thursday if anyone has any questions. And I also have a session tomorrow where we talk about the bills and the CFEDs and the cadastral fiduciary trust model. Now, what did you just say about contains and aggregate? What oh, yeah, I glossed over that one, didn't I? <laughs> I'll, get, I'll get to you. <laughs> Thank you all. So the question was uh, contains. So we have two area statements that we use. Area, singular, area contains or areas, plural, areas aggregate. The difference between the two is whether the parcels are contiguous or not. And the simple trick that I teach is that if you, if you have your parcel on, on a map and you draw a line, can you draw a line around everything that you're describing and close right back where you started? That's area, one single area contains. If I have to pick up my pencil and draw separate parcels, those are areas in the areas aggregate. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I wish I could have spent more time on it.